All right, Joe, uh, episode two, Fireside uh, Financial. So as promised, CPP and OAS is the topic today. Yeah, so this is something that you mentioned before when we were going over topics, uh, gets a big hit on your YouTube or uh, any other channels when you're putting information out. And, you know, I'd say I see the exact same thing. It's a question that so many people have as they're starting retirement or getting close to retirement or even just getting to that age where they can start to uh, receive these benefits, right? So Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'm sure that our listeners are happy we're talking about it again, and I'm excited to get your perspective today. Yeah, it's a it's a tough, you know, my perspective over the years has definitely changed and largely due with um, the advancement in our in our software and being able to run uh, scenarios, if you will, like unique scenarios. And it truly, it is not, uh, there's no, there is no uh, hard rule, I would say, with CPP and OAS of when to take them, um, because it's very unique to to every individual. Um, but I often find that that's one of the bigger questions, like when do I start drawing it and, um, you know, how much would I expect to receive and questions about like, well, if I get the, est- the CPP estimator from my CRA website, is it assuming that I'm still working to 65 if I delay and, and things of those, those natures or the questions of that in that nature come into play. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've definitely shifted, I guess, in my practice over the last few years is, is really a, I guess, a push to have people delay further. Mm-hmm. And to your point, I mean, every situation is different. Um, but yeah, with the, the software and with uh, some more research done by FP Canada recently mm-hmm. on delaying CPP, like the benefits of that, it's uh, looking more and more um, like the right choice for a lot of the clients that I'm working with anyway. I don't, I'm not sure kind of your thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. For the most part, it does. Like as Funny, sometimes it'd be um, like you start moving, what if husband took it at 63, wife took it at 65, or you start moving that toggle between 60 and 70 for each individual, there becomes a, um, you know, a mute point where it doesn't seem to have a positive or negative effect uh, on their plan, but then you extend it two more years and all of a sudden now it's like a 2% increase in the plan success. Um, So yeah, but typically speaking, yeah, the longer they would delay uh, receiving that income is just more of a guaranteed income that they would receive. So this might mean that we got to draw more out of their RSPs in the first five, 10 years, right? Um, but then once CPP kicks in, they have less amount in their RSP account, um, which is now going to have to convert to a RIF, um, which would add more income as well. Uh, but the numbers seem to uh, balance out really good in, in their plan. And as well as it gives them more of a guaranteed amount for the rest of their lives. And typically doing that strategy, there's less chance of OAS clawback. Yeah, it's a really good point. So there are a few things I'm looking at when I'm when I'm thinking about delay, and that is uh is one is just from a taxation standpoint. Mm-hmm. Anything left, as you know, in rifts when um someone passes away or the surviving spouse passes away is fully taxable, mm-hmm. right? So it's not the ideal place to be leaving yeah. investments. Um so that kind of period between age 60 and 70. And this is especially for people who have higher amounts in their the retirement accounts, mm-hmm. right? Or just in yeah. investments in general. So, you know, this might look a little different for someone in a different situation. But if we can kind of take that period and delay CPP and OAS after 65, uh, take more investments or withdrawals out of those retirement accounts when we're in that lower tax bracket, yeah. then once they're getting to the point where they have to take CPP and OAS, uh, they have to take the RIF minimums. The RIF minimums are generally mm-hmm. lower at that point. Yep. Um, and we're able to just create less lifetime taxes, yep. right? So not necessarily l- less taxes year by year during the 60s and 70s, but when we're looking, you know, considering the estate and, and later uh, incomes, then we're able to really reduce those lifetime taxes and, and including in a lot of cases, OAS clause back, as you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, I found that uh, OAS, delaying OAS hasn't, it doesn't seem to, well, it's a smaller amount, I guess. I mean, that's why, but it doesn't seem to move the needle as much as CPP does. No, it's not a, it's not as much, but the other thing, or I was saying there's kind of two things I'm looking at. The other one is life expectancies are, you know, they're growing. They're, mm-hmm. they're going to eventually, I think, start increasing a lot quicker as medical advancements continue. Like I think it's 2035 is the the year we're supposed to reach um, singularity, which is where AI catches up to human intelligence. I heard so we'll that see. On your it scares me. I'm like, ah. <laughs> yeah, right. So now, if that is the case, though, and all of a sudden we see people, you know, consistently living an extra 20 or 30 years over what we're seeing now, which is what the prediction from a lot of people is, that's where 
that delay of OAS, mm-hmm. even and, and the CPP, like having that guaranteed income that's increasing with inflation each year is going to have a, a huge impact because uh, assuming, you know, <laughs> the, the government and everything is in a, a good uh, position financially, that's going to continue to go on forever. Mm-hmm where we might be looking really good for how much is in our investments mm-hmm. if we're looking out 30 or 40 years. But if all of a sudden we're looking at 50 or 60 years, that might look a lot different, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think too, another you know thing to think about when taking CP, and this would be maybe for um, husband, wife, uh, or male, female partner, if you will, um, delaying the, the female's uh, amount until let's say age 70, and maybe taking the male's amount earlier, just simply due to life expectancy, like time frame of life expectancy, right? Would I guess allow if they needed the amount, like if they needed that for income. Sometimes I found that to be, um, you know, maybe he's, you know, not thinking that he would live past eighty-five or something like that, right? Um, so maybe in those cases, and it could be legitimate uh, health reasons that they would be considering. So maybe in the fear of missing out on anything. Maybe they might want to take that earlier and delay one of the other uh, partners, right? To have a more, um, a larger amount, I guess, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Just in general, females having longer life expectancy, right? Mm-hmm. And um, but you also mentioned health, right? I, that's a big factor in taking CPP mm-hmm. or OAS as early as possible, right? Mm-hmm. If if you know there's some kind of longevity uh, risk, or so I shouldn't say risk. I guess just the idea that you know maybe there is some kind of medical issue that will cause mm-hmm. a, a lower life expectancy. Mm-hmm. Then that's definitely a good reason to, to be taking it early. Yeah. Um, there's some other reasons too, as far as you know how many years you worked or if you had lower income jobs where you weren't um, contributing the max to CPP things like that, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're going to retire at say age 55, mm-hmm. well you can only throw out I think it's eight years, right? Yeah. Eight years that you uh, had no contributions or lower contributions so out of the calculation. Mm-hmm. So if you're too many years before age 65, you can't get the max anyway. Mm-hmm. So in that case, rather than having, uh, I guess, more of a, a penalty by having years where you weren't contributing, it might make sense to start taking it earlier as yeah. well. That's one of, the, one of the other reasons we might want to look at taking it earlier. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And again, it's it's very unique to, to, to everyone's situation. So it's one of those things that you really can't answer. Like it's a tough you know, it's a common question, but um, sound like a broken record here, but you really can't answer that question unless, you know, uh, all the other financial aspects of an individual's life and what their wishes are and uh, plans and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Now, I'm curious, Regan, what are some of the reasons that you hear from whether it's clients or potential clients or just in general of why people decide or how they decide to take it assuming they're not talking to a financial planner uh well if there's no um i think it has a little bit to do with the the um how much wealth they have and how many buckets of wealth and the variety of buckets of wealth they have right i think people who are i guess a little more comfortable are less concerned about when to take cpp and when not to because it doesn't really really affect them that much um so that i think plays a role in it you know Um, the other thing that i've found is that uh, if they have, um, you know, I guess if they if they have kids and things like this, right? So maybe they're not worried about leaving a legacy. So they'd want to take it earlier to get as much as they can in their lifetime possible, right? Um, which is a fair point, right? So if that means that, you know, they start taking it sooner, that means they have to draw more out of their RSPs uh, throughout their lifetime and their TFSAs, non-reg, whatever it is, which leaves their net worth, uh, let's say at age 90, less you know it's they're typically not gonna be concerned about how much money they're leaving behind because they don't have children or someone like that that they they feel like they need to leave money behind for sure yeah yeah i'm uh I'm, i hate to say it but the the reason that i <laughs> I, I get most often is that well i've been paying the government for my whole life i just want to get my money back <laughs> yeah yeah uh so that's that's kind of the, the consensus answer that i get from people when even if they haven't taken it yet but we're talking about planning and uh, I, might, I might ask them, you know, have you thought about kind of what your your strategy would be for when you take CPP or OAS? And mm. uh, I get that probably at least one of every two people I ask, which is a little bit scary to me because there is a lot to consider when making that decision. So I just always encourage, and I always, and, and I mention this now because I encourage people, um, you know, you can decide when you want to take it, but 
but don't take it just because you have a chip on your shoulder, right. the government, try to give it a little thought about your situation and what's going to be in your best interest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, it's a good point because, you know, CBP is a very healthy, um, a very healthy pension fund. Like it's, um, you know, it's not, uh, from everything that I've been reading anyways, it seems to be a very healthy, um, you know, and there's no yeah, risk of it, you know, not being able to continue doing what it's doing. So we've, everyone contributes to it. Um, you know, and so the government's really just the channel to to make those transactions, but it's not, they're not the Canadian pension plan. They just have more of the rules and like how much we get and how much we put in and all that kind of stuff. So, so I agree with you. I think, um, you know, going at it with a, like you said, a chip on your shoulder, um, I don't think that's the proper way to look at it. Um, you really do have to look at it from your overall spectrum and where is that sweet spot specifically for you. Um, and that's the ultimate time that would be your ultimate or your optimal time to take it. And I think just even having that information, like when you sat down with yourself or someone like uh, myself or you, you know, we're going to go through and find that absolute sweet spot. Um, and then being able to understand what the, the pros, cons, uh, the differences it makes, like you said, on your lifetime tax payable or how it affects your net worth um, or how it affects your cash flow now and in your 70s and 80s. Um, get that information first and then make a decision because doing it uh, without having all that other all those other answers you really are just putting yourself in this little uh, chamber and trying to make the decision with with no real uh, good data yeah exactly exactly i just i think it's really important people are considering the big picture when they're making these decisions because this is one it's one decision or we'll call it two maybe we're talking about cpp and oas mm -hmm. but uh, it factors into a, a bigger picture of all your retirement income planning, right? And also there's tax planning involved in that. So there's a lot going on in that one decision. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's, uh, I think we will probably circle back to this conversation again in the future about things that uh, in regards to CBP and OAS, um, you know, uh, but uh, to end this one off, I think it'd be good to let the listeners know, I guess, uh, where they could find your podcast and I'll do, uh, I'll do the same. Sure. So uh, my podcast is Your Retirement Planning Simplified uh, for anybody who hasn't already found it. And I'm probably by the time this comes out, I'll we'll actually have a new website launch that I'm pretty excited about. So it's um, retirementplanningsimplified.ca. And so on there, you'll be able to find the podcast, blog, uh, any kind of other information we're putting out from an educational standpoint. So I'm pretty excited about that. Again, I think it should be good yeah. to go by the time this episode comes out. Nice. So what that, about yourself? Is again? that just a, a sorry? Go ahead. Yeah. Is that just like a, educational hub for you then? Yeah. So what I'm uh, doing right now is basically separating up my financial planning and retirement planning business from the educational side, because mm. um, I really want to put a focus on the stuff that you and I are doing right now and putting out good information just to educate people. Because uh, like you know, I mean, we can't work with every single person that needs our help, right? So, um, and in some cases, people don't need our help. They can do this, but they just need a little information. And for other people, it's just about um, having enough knowledge so that they feel comfortable approaching someone in our situation. So long story short, yeah, we're really just trying to have this educational brand, Retirement Planning Simplified, which is all about just, um, I guess, empowering people to make good decisions around the retirement planning. And, and that's what that site's going to be all about. Nice. That's that's pretty awesome, actually. Um, yeah. So ours is, uh, for your listeners, uh, it's your Canadian retirement specialist and kind of same idea, uh, you know, through the various social media channels, you know, we're just trying to put out uh, good content and, you know, trying to give information to empower people and also give them, like you said, confidence if they were to need to reach out to an advisor, um, you know, give them some general uh, knowledge so that they don't feel intimidated, right? Yeah, you've probably ran into that, Regan. I know I, I get that quite a bit, actually. When people talk to me for the first time, they say, you know, Joe, I've uh, I've never actually reached out to a financial planner before because I'm just kind of embarrassed about what I don't know and I'm scared I'm going to ask stupid questions. And they kind of lead with that coming into the conversation. Yeah. So that, like, to me, that's kind of heartbreaking that people aren't getting the help that, you know, they could have been getting 10 years ago. Mm -hmm just because uh, of how they feel around that. So that's a big part of why I decided to kind of go down this road of, uh, or this road of education. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's uh, very true. Actually, just recently I've dealt with that where uh, someone was a, kind of a, a do it yourselfer, if you will. Um, but as they got closer and closer retirement, um, like this year and next year, basically a husband wife kind of thing. Um, they were like, okay, we need to, we need to, to speak to some, someone. So our, 
our client had uh, referred them to us. Um, but they were able to watch a lot of our content before they we met with them. And she said the same thing that she was intimidated because they were embarrassed about certain things. And um, but and, and also a little bit of lack of knowledge on just how to start actually doing the the true retirement planning. But I think it's important yeah. for people to know that you and I are not we don't care how much you know or don't. That's not. We're not uh, judging by no means. Like we, we have very, um, like we've seen quite, a, we've seen just about every situation there is and different variances of knowledge and everyone's different. And we definitely do not um, judge in that category. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you and I wouldn't have a job <laughs> if uh, everyone was an expert. Yeah, so yeah. uh, it was definitely no judgment. Yeah. And we just know, I mean, there's a lot of things that I don't know anything about and I'm not good at. Yeah. Um, and this just happens to be the area where you and I, you know, have a bit of a passion and, and are able to help people. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think the takeaway there is, uh, don't be afraid to reach out to a, a qualified advisor for, for retirement planning help. You got it. Perfect. Oh, All right. Well, it's been great you. chatting again. And, uh, yeah, I guess we will circle back and hopefully see you in a month. Sounds good. Rico. All right. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye.